Open up your Bibles to two places. One, John 10 and verse 10. And then secondly, to Acts chapter 20. Acts chapter 20 and verse 35. John 10 and verse 10 says it this way. It says, the thief does not come except to steal, to kill, and to destroy. I have come, Jesus talking, that they may have life and that they may have it more abundantly. Amen. The Amplified Bible says it this way. He says, I came that they may have and enjoy life and have it in abundance to the full till it overflows. We've spent the past few weeks looking particularly at this verse and how it pertains to our life. The reality is this, that if you have Jesus, you have life in God or you have the life of God in you. If you don't believe in him, haven't confessed him, then you're not living life as God intended for you to live. Amen. Jesus said not only to, to have the life, but Amplified Bible, he says to have and enjoy the life. How many of you are enjoying the life that you have in Jesus? Amen. That's most of you. The rest of you will work on that today. Hallelujah. Yeah, having and enjoying the life. The Message Bible says it this way. He says, I came so that they can have real and eternal life, more and better life than they ever dreamed of. Now, if you can remember back before you had Jesus, and then you can remember after you had Jesus, come on, isn't that more and better than you ever dreamed of? Come on now, that's good stuff right there. So he wants you to enjoy life. He wants you to have joy in the life that you have Amen. in him. Amen. And so there's certainly some things that we can do to make sure that we're lining up with his word so that we are enjoying the life that we have in Christ. And so we've looked at some different things concerning that. And this morning, I want to look at another one. And it's found in Acts chapter 20 and verse 35. Acts chapter 20 and verse 35 says this. I have shown you in every way by laboring like this that you must support the weak, and remember the words of the Lord Jesus that he said, it is more blessed to give than to receive. It is more blessed to give than to receive. Now that word blessed, of course, means what you think it means. I mean, blessed, fortunate, well off. But one of the meanings of that word blessed in the Greek is the word happy. Happy. So you could really read it like this. He says, uh, you'll have more happiness and joy in giving than in receiving. Or you should have more joy and happiness in giving than in receiving. Now, uh, most of us really enjoy getting things, receiving things, and I'm not going to ask for a show of hands, but probably all of you here don't mind getting stuff on your birthday or, or on Christmas or something special, right? Amen. You enjoy getting something, but right here he says there, there should be for us as believers more joy in giving than in receiving. More joy in giving than in receiving. Really, when you have the life of Christ and you're living as Christ has called you to live, then there's more joy in the giving of what he has given to you than in just receiving from others. Amen. And so, uh, you know, just uh, last week or so, um, we went to New Orleans because we had to get a passport for Aaron Cody and for Avery Jane because, we're, again, we're traveling to Columbia and so had to get their passports renewed. And so we went there and on the way back, we stopped by the Mall of Louisiana like, you know, any good person would, right? Stopped by the mall, Louisiana in Baton Rouge and just hung out there, ate, shopped a little bit, hung out. And so uh, we're there and right there in the food court in the mall of Louisiana, there's a carousel. Anybody know what I'm talking about? There's a carousel right there. And so uh, we go, we get our food and, and, and we're sitting down and, and Avery, you know, she's like, I, I want to ride the carousel. I want to ride the carousel. And she had one of her friends with her. Cece was with her. And so uh, uh, she's like, we, we want to ride the carousel. So I, I said, well, I gave her like a dollar or something. I said, find out, find out how much it is. That should be about right. So how many of you know it's not a dollar to ride the carousel? <laughs> yeah, it's not. It's not a dollar to do anything anymore. So uh, um, even the dollar theater is like $5. So <laughs> if there is a dollar, the okay, all right. So anyway, so, so I get, she comes back and she goes, well, well dad, it's $5. I'm like, Sweet Lord, hallelujah, $5 to ride the carousel. I mean, go around in circles on a fake horse that does that right there. I'm thinking, you know, all right. So uh, I said, well, here you go, here's $5. So come to find out, $5 gets you three tokens, which is three rides on, on the carousel, all right? So it's, it's a little bit more fair, fair deal there. And so, you know, they get the three tokens, and so uh, they get on it, and they ride it. Well, after they ride it, they got one token left, which is a dilemma, right? Because there's two kids and one token. So how many of y'all know I'm not giving her another $5 for, for two more rides? We'll do that for something. We'll save the five for something else. And so I said, I got an idea. So they come off, they come off the carousel and I said, I got an idea. idea. Let's take the one token that we have left and how about y'all pick a kid sitting around here, sitting around the carousel and you just give it to that kid and to their family and just bless them with it. And I tell you what, their eyes lit up. 
They got all happy. They got all excited. They took that one token. They went over this one table. There was this little, little boy, maybe two or three years old, and, and they gave the token to him and, and to his family. And I stood over the side and watched, and they were just happy. They smiled, and they thanked them, and then waved at me or something like that, you know. And the, the girls, I found out, the two little girls, they had more joy in giving the one token away than they did riding the fake horse going up and down. They had more joy in the giving than in the receiving. And sometimes we have like a, 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 we have like a reverse thinking. Like we think it, if we get a whole lot more, then we'll have a whole lot more and therefore we'll have more joy. When in reality, if we'll learn to give more, we'll have more joy in our life. So one of the, one of the primary keys of enjoying life is not living life selfishly but living life generously, finding a way that you can give of yourself, of your time, of your effort, of your energy, of your finances, and to be a blessing to those around you. Come on, somebody. Amen? Amen. I, I tell you, if, if you're sitting there, and I would think of myself as a generous person, but uh, if you're sitting there, you're thinking, I'm pretty generous, the, the, the real key to finding out if you're generous is if there's any testimonies around you of your generosity. Amen. Hallelujah. That means there should be people who can testify to the fact that that is a generous person. They maybe sacrificed something so that I could get some, or, or they made a way for me to go somewhere or to do something or to be a blessing to me, or, or I know they're praying for me. That's a sacrifice. Or they give their time, their effort to be a blessing. To me. They're a generous person, right? Amen. Well, the same could be said of God. God is a good God and God is a generous God. How many of y'all can testify to the fact that God is full of mercy? Come on now. How many of y'all can testify, uh, testify to the fact that God is filled with love and he's poured out his love upon you? Come on, anybody testify to the fact that God is a God filled with joy and he's given you his joy? Come on, anybody can testify to the fact that God is a God of great grace and that grace has abounded to you in your life? Amen. Well, in Matthew, I believe it's Matthew chapter 10, Matthew chapter 10 and verse eight, it says it this way. It says, heal the sick, cleanse the lepers, raise the dead, cast out demons. Freely you have received, freely give. Freely you have received, freely give. The message Bible, I love what it says. It says, you have been treated generously, so live generously. You have been, basically, basically, God has been so good to you, you should let that goodness flow through you. His goodness flow through you. That, that means basically his mercy has abounded so much to you, you ought to be filled with mercy toward others. His love has abounded toward you so much, you ought to let his love just abound through you. His blessing has come upon your life. If it's financially, that blessing has come upon you. It's not just for yourself. It's so that you can be a blessing to those around you. It's not just for yourself. We're not supposed to, to be a cesspool in this life. We are to be a river in this life, not a, a pond that just has nasty stuff growing on it. Hallelujah. But a river that brings life everywhere that it goes. Praise God. You have been treated generously, therefore live generously. In fact, generosity begins with God. Generosity begins with God. John 3, 16 says, for God so loved the world that he gave, God demonstrated his love and his generosity in giving us the greatest gift. Actually, the Bible says this indescribable gift. One translation says, a gift too wonderful for words. That means what we have received in Jesus is the greatest, most generous gift that we could ever receive from anyone at any time ever. Yeah. Amen. Hallelujah. That means God has been generous with you. He has been good to you. And he's telling his disciples right here, he says, because I've been good to you, because I've been generous to you, because I, I've given you freely, I want you to let that flow through you. Bring deliverance wherever you go. Bring peace wherever you go. Bring life wherever you go. Come on, bring healing wherever you go. Let what I've done in you, let that flow through you and live generously. Don't hold back on people. Make sure to let it flow through you. Praise God. You've been treated generously. Everybody said God's been good to me. Amen. He's a good God. He's been better to you than, than you realize. Than you realize. Amen. I like the way James 1.17, it says it this way. It says, every good and every perfect gift is from above and comes down from the Father of lights. It means every good, every perfect gift, every good thing comes down from him and flows through him. Praise God. Hallelujah. 
Amen. So when we give, and we give generously, and we live generously, then we're acting like God. Because he's generous. God is generous, and we begin to live generously, we begin to act like him. When we have mercy on people, we're acting like the God who had mercy on us. When we love people, we're acting like the God who loved us when we were unlovable. Come on, somebody. When we have grace on people, we're acting like the God who's had great grace upon us. Amen. When we give to others, even when they don't deserve it, it's the same as when God gives to us and is a blessing to us, even when we don't deserve it at times. Amen. So then we need to live like he's called us to live, and that is generously. And as we do, we'll have more joy in our living. We'll have more joy in our, our daily life, just enjoying the life that he's given to us and letting that flow through us. Amen. Amen. Praise God. Now I want you to turn back to John chapter 10, and I want you to see this here. John chapter 10, and it's, it's the verse right after what we've been focusing in on, which is John 10, 10, but we're gonna look at verse 11. So right after he says, I have come that they may have life and that they may have it more abundantly. Then it says this, I am the good shepherd and the good shepherd gives his life for the sheep. Notice that. He says, I'm the good shepherd and the good shepherd does what? Gives his life. He gives his life for the sheep. What is, what is Jesus saying right here? He says, I've come and the reason I've come is to give. The reason I've come is to give you life and to give my life. I've come to, to bring something to you. Now, I believe that the example that Jesus set is the example that we are to follow. What is that example? To give of ourselves, to give of our life for the sake of others. Right? So then to live generously is more than putting $10 in a bucket or, 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 or buying your wife a card or something like that. To live generously is literally giving your life, giving of yourself, giving of who you are, right? So if we're to live generously toward others, if we're to live generously toward the plan and purpose of God that he has for us, which is to reach others, then we're going to have to we're gonna to have to make some decisions that, that are selfless decisions instead of selfish decisions. Amen. That means we've gotta move past, I'm making a decision that makes me feel good and then make a decision now that I wanna make other people feel good. I want other people to be blessed. I want other people to get ahead. I, want to, I know this is opposite of the way everybody thinks in this world, because everybody in this world thinks, you know, it's me, me, I'm number one. They, 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 you know, there's no I in team, but that. <laughs> There is a me. Right? And so that's how every, I'm just taking care of number one. I'm just taking care of number one. Now you just take care of number one and you're gonna have a whole great harvest of just selfishness coming towards you. But if you live generously and you sow seeds of blessing into others, sow seeds of blessing into your family, sow seeds of blessing into those maybe that you do not know, sow them into coworkers, sow them into the community, sow blessing out, then guess what? There's a harvest of blessing that abounds towards you as you sow goodness toward others, as you sow finances toward others, as you sow effort toward others, as you sow mercy toward others, you've got to break this mind, 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 selfish, selfish, selfish mindset and break into, man, the kingdom of God is about reaching others, about loving others, about being a blessing, about seeing what I can do to give of myself, even if nobody recognizes it but God. The mind mentality should be broken when you are born into the kingdom of God. Amen. Living generously. In Mark chapter 10, we see the story of two of Jesus' closest disciples, James and John. They come up to Jesus and they say, Jesus, we want you to do something for us. And he says, what is it? So we want to sit at your right and at your left hand in glory. They say that. He says, you don't know what you're asking for. He said, are you willing to be baptized in the baptism that I, I'm going to put you through or I got to take myself? Well, yes, sir. He said, well, in fact, you will. But then he brings him to, to a, even a greater point And he says this. Basically, he's saying, you just got the wrong mindset. He says, 
yet it shall not be among you. And he, he was actually talking about, uh, speaking about some leaders and those who are in authority and how they're great and how ever they're perceived to be great. He says, but whoever desires to be, become great among you shall be your servant. And whoever of you desires to be first shall be the slave of all. For even the son of man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life a ransom for many. How many of y'all would, would agree that Jesus, if anybody deserved to be served out of everyone? And in fact, we know that people did serve him, right? The disciples were serving him and we'd go to people's homes, they would serve him. So it's not that he was opposed to being served as a leader, but his mindset was not, I came to be served, so serve me. His mindset was, I came to see what, what I could bring, what value I could add to you so I could bring out the purpose, the plan, the call that my father has for you. I, I'm thinking bigger than just bring me a glass of water. I want your attitude to be like mine which is let's lay down our life for something that is greater than just ourselves. He said, if you want to be great, now I like this, and I heard one minister preach it this way, and it's really good. He said, it's not that God doesn't want you to be great. He just has a different way of getting you there. So we think greatness, and what do you think? I mean, automatically you think great, and you think of somebody who's maybe really smart or, or, or has a lot of degrees or they have a lot of money or they have a, a successful business, right? That's kind of our mindset. That's great. I mean, those people are really great, and they've got a, a plaque on the wall or they got uh, recognized by Time Magazine or uh, in the paper or something like that. And, and Jesus is saying, my, my scale of greatness is not the same as the guy that you see out on the street or, or whoever who has great power. My greatness is not because you have great power in the sense of this natural world. He says, my, my greatness that God has for you, my Father has for you, comes through getting down. Now that's, that's hard for most people to swallow because I want to be great on my own right, right? I want to be great because so many people serve me. That means I am great. Everybody wants to be around me. Everybody writes good things about me, talks about me, says good things, right? That means I'm great. And Jesus is saying, that, that doesn't mean you're great. Uh, how many of you know that, that the, the, the one who's truly taken account of greatness um, is God, He's the one who's judging my motives as to my preaching right now. He's the one who judges your life and one day you'll stand before him and give an account for your life. He's the one that does that. Now we can certainly see the fruit of people's lives and you can certainly tell a lot by the fruit of people's lives. However, God is the ultimate judge. God is the ultimate judge. That means the attitude in which we are to do things needs to be lined up with what Jesus is saying here. What is he saying? He said, look guys, it's not about you trying to figure out how you can, you can weasel your way up to the left and to the right while the other 10 are having lunch. If you read the scripture, it says that the other 10 were upset at James and John. Why would they be upset? Because these guys are trying to sneak in close with Jesus while they're doing something else. I don't know what the other guys are doing, you know, uh, uh, clipping their toenails or taking a bath or eating lunch or, or on, a, on a break somewhere. I don't know, but James and John found a way to get off of Jesus. Jesus, uh, 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 can't you see it kind of being sneaky? Like, uh, how can we, how can we? In fact, if you read other passages that par parallel, Matthew, it says that their mother was there. Now, that's a whole nother story right there. Mama's like, how can I get my boys up into greatness? <laughs> Jesus said, uh, first of all, you're going to go through more than you realize you're going to go through. Uh, second of all, greatness is not the greatness that you're thinking of. The one who will be great is the one who's willing to not be seen as great. Hmm. Now, huh, because we're all about trying to find a way to get our names out there, right? I mean, come on, everybody, see me, see me. Come on, I'm doing a good job. Come on, somebody pat me on the back. Come on, somebody write me up at the job, say you're doing a good job. Come on, somebody, come on, somebody tell me. Come on, and Jesus is like, look, if nobody ever sees, 
If nobody ever notices, if you don't get the bonus or the raise or you don't get a pat on the back or a plaque at Vision Banquet or you don't get anything, that, that's okay. Because in my book, I'm calling you great because you're willing to do something with no credit. I wonder how, how, and this is a great church, but I wonder how much greater this church would be if we all served without caring who gets the credit. I'll do whatever, Pastor. Uh, you may be a multimillionaire. Uh, I'll do whatever, Pastor. Uh, not because I have a lot of money or don't have a lot of money, but because I'm called to be a servant by Jesus. It's not about my, what car I drove up in today. It's about my heart, my attitude, my mindset. My mindset is, I'm in his kingdom. I'll serve. And it's funny to me how the Lord will take those who are willing to be low and he'll raise those up. And even when he raises them up, they're still almost like, oh, don't say nothing, please. Please don't say it. Why? Because it's not about that. Never was. Now, there's another interesting story. Are y'all still with me or y'all? Okay, I know this is not like a run around the church uh, service just yet. Maybe I can get Greg back up here and we'll see if we can work something out. Uh, but, but there's another interesting story that, that, um, that we read of Jesus. And he's basically at the, at, at the house with his disciples. And he stops everything and he begins to wash their feet. Jesus began to wash the disciples' feet. Now, if you understand anything about that time, you realize they're wearing sandals and they have dirty feet. They're not, they're not walking on like a, a, a sidewalk with socks and shoes on, all right? They're walking around, sandals on, down a dirty street. What do they ride on? Like donkeys and camels, right? Right, so they're walking down the street, same place the donkeys and the camels walk and where they, they poop and all that junk, all that junk's going on. They got all that junk on them. And Jesus is washing their feet. Now, that's interesting to me that Jesus would do what is considered to be the lowest thing that you could possibly do. Lowest thing that you could, in fact, I believe it's Peter that says, Lord, do not wash my feet. You cannot wash my feet. And Jesus said, oh yes, I must wash your feet. If, if I don't wash your feet, you have no part of me. He says, well, then wash my head too. Wash every part of me. Do everything, right? And Peter's extreme on everything. So he washes their feet. Now, this is what he says about this. At the very, it's John 13, and at the end, uh, verse 14 through 17, it says, if I then, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also ought to wash one another's feet. Amen. For I have given you an example that you should do as I have done to you. Most assuredly, I say to you, a servant is not greater than his master, nor is uh, who is sent greater than he who sent him. If you know these things, blessed are you if you do them. Did y'all catch that? He said blessed. Y'all know what that word blessed is? Fortunate, well off, but what else is it? Are y'all missing the point? Did y'all get that? You're what? So you're telling me, Pastor Ann, the happy person is the one who's washing the crud off of people's feet. Yes. Not because you're forced to, because you willingly do so. Now, you, you'll find out if you're a servant or not, and you, if you have this attitude, when you're treated like one. Anybody ever thought you had a pretty good attitude about serving and helping? And then someone asks you to do something that you're like, Hey, what's up? What's up with that? Am I your servant? <laughs> Wait, well, I thought you said you were a servant. Well, I am the servant, but I ain't doing that. Now, I found this, that the one thing that you, you cross the line and say, I ain't doing that. I'll serve in any area, but I won't do that, is the one area that God's going to test you and say, serve me in that way. Yeah. I want to be great. All right, I, let me tell you how. Serve. I want to preach, serve. I want to go around the world, serve. I want to have a great business, serve. I want, I want my family to love me, serve them. 
If you want to be great in the kingdom of God, you have to learn to be the servant of all. He says, if I have done this for you, don't you think you should do this with your brothers and sisters? Now, I grew up in church where we had foot washing services. Anybody ever been to a foot washing service? Raise your hand if you've been. I mean, it's an interesting experience. I remember the first time I ever went to one, I was maybe 10 years old, 9, 10 years old, somewhere in there. It was at my papa's church. And I didn't know. They didn't tell us. So how many of you know, if you know you're having a foot washing service, what do you do? Like, you make sure your socks match, get a pedicure, clip those nails, get the fungus out, you know, do something. You got you to gotta clean it up somehow or another. Uh, have somebody help you. And so I'm sitting there and I was really nervous about this foot washing service because uh, the girl sitting next to me was real pretty. And it wasn't just you go up and we had like buckets on the stage and on the front row. And so you go, it wasn't just that the pastor and the staff washed your feet, you washed each other's feet. And so that meant, you know, um, this girl's about to see my toes and I'm about to wash her feet. It made me really nervous. And so, I mean, I was sweating. I was hoping that, you know, the the fuzz on my socks didn't stay in between my toes. I mean, I was all, I was was nervous about this thing. I was thinking, did I take a bath today? I don't remember. (laughs) And so, I mean, I had all these crazy thoughts going through my head. But it's actually a very humbling thing to have your feet washed. To realize that someone is saying, I'm willing to serve you. Now, we did the same thing when we, had youth, when we were youth ministry. We had our, all our youth leaders. We went over to someone's house and we washed their feet. And I tell you, I felt the presence of God in that apartment. I mean, people were crying, and I don't know if it's because of somebody's feet or, or, or <laughs> if it was the anointing, uh, but there were tears being shed, you know. <laughs> I don't know if it, I don't know. <laughs> all right, I'll stop there. Praise the Lord. So, but, but my point is this. He said, if I have served you in this capacity, you are to serve one another. That doesn't necessarily mean you have to, every week I'm going to wash somebody's feet and show them how much I serve them, right? What is he talking about here? He says, you have to be willing to do what is the lowest if you want to be considered the greatest. And Jesus, of all people, could have said, I'm not washing feet. They need to wash my feet. I performed miracles all day long. I've been teaching for a few days here, right on this mountain or on this side of the hill. I've been teaching for days and, and somebody needs to not only wash, they need to rub my feet. My feet hurt. <laughs> and if you preach a lot, your feet do end up hurting. <laughs> but, but what does he say? I'm going to wash your feet. Now, something interesting in the book of uh, Philippians, it says this. It says, let this mind be in you And one translation says this attitude, Philippians 2, 5. Let this mind, this attitude be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God, did not consider it robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation, taking the form of a bondservant and coming in the likeness of men. What is he telling them? Paul is saying this, let the same attitude that Jesus had when he submitted himself to come to this earth, let that same attitude and that mindset be in you. What's gonna happen if you live like this? So oh God, everybody's just gonna run over me all the time. It's gonna be horrible. You now what does he say? You're gonna be blessed. How many of y'all wanna live happy? Amen. Serve. How can I serve? You can start at the house. How else can I serve? You can start in the church house. How else can you serve? You can serve in your community. How else can you serve? You can serve your brother and sister. I I can't tell you how much joy it would bring me to find out that somebody in this church offered to mow someone else in this church mow their yard for a month in the summertime for nothing. I can't do that. Why can't you do that? I got my own yard to mow. You what? I got my own yard. What? I got my own yard to mow. Yeah, but what about your brother and sister? Maybe they're in a tight spot. Uh, Maybe it's a single mom. Maybe she has a yard and needs mowed. Maybe you ought to be a blessing to her. I can't do that. Yes, you can do that. 
It would be hard for me to do that. That might be the perfect thing to do, the thing that's hard to do. Praise God. I've, I've realized this. If you're gonna serve God, nothing can be beneath you. Did you hear me? Nothing can be beneath you. Are y'all, come on, y'all give me some more amens. I know this is tough, but nothing can be beneath you. Like walking through the church. I, I, I do it to this day. If I'm walking through the church, you see something, something's out of line, chair's out of line, straighten the chair. I'm not an usher. Straighten the chair. It's garbage on the floor. Well, that's for someone else to do. We pay people to do that. You're in the kingdom. It's your church. Pick up the garbage. Oh, I noticed the parking lot has some issues. And what, what kind of issues? We'll fix the issues. I can't believe people would what? Pe- pe- people are a mess. The Bible says where no oxen are in the stall is clean. That means if this place is dirty, that's good. You know what that means? There are people here. I love it. Okay. Oh my God, we have to clean this building every week. Yes. You know why? Because people walk in here, have church, and leave. Some people even come while I'm preaching and clip their fingernails. While I'm preaching, we got to vacuum it up. We had somebody that ate sunflower seeds while I'm preaching. <laughs> we got to clean it up after. Can you believe the disrespect? Hey, what you going to do? We're going to vacuum up the sunflower seeds. Amen. You mean those things that have been in somebody else's mouth or on the carpet where we get on our knees and pray? Yes! <laughs> Why? Because there are people here who need help. People who do that need a lot of help. But I'm just saying... Regardless, you want to be great in the kingdom of God? There is nothing that is beneath you. Amen. Nothing that is beneath you. I said nothing that is beneath you. I, I, I remember first, first starting out here and, and, you know, my dad's a firm believer in work work. You know what I mean by work work? Like, and nothing wrong with computer work and all that stuff. There's a lot of, a lot of money in that nowadays. But uh, he believed in like work work, like sweat work, like hands hurt work, back hurts work. Like, you know, you feel like you're about to have, a, you know, a, a heat stroke work. Like, oh, God, help me not die today. And so he'd, he'd put us out, put, put my sister out at times like, you know, you need to, you need to clip the hedges around our house. I mean, clip the hedges in the summertime, but not with like, like, (laughs) 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 yeah, not too long ago, just a a few months ago, we were up here at the church and, um, and the hedges were getting out of line around here. And so I I met with all the staff guys. I said, all right, on, I think it was a Thursday on Thursday, bring your boots, (laughs) bring your dirty clothes. I'm bringing mine. We are going to clip the hedges around this building and we're going to clean it up. And so we all showed up on a Thursday, you know, preach on a Wednesday night, clip the hedges on Thursday. Oh, I don't do that on a regular basis. I need to spend more time praying and studying uh, than doing that all the time. We do have people that do that, but I ain't, I ain't beneath, it ain't beneath me to clean the toilet that you just put your behind on. <laughs> It ain't, and now it ain't, it's not my priority. It needs to be somebody else doing that. But I'm just saying, uh, I, I ain't so far removed that I can't do something if I have to. Yep. Amen. Yeah. So if we walk in here like, man, I'm a child of God. Everything is, I am a new creation in Christ. I reign victorious. Now you reign victorious and pick up the garbage. Yeah. Reign victorious as you pick up the garbage with a smile on your face. Because there is joy when you do it right. Well, if you want to be great in the kingdom, and that's why so many people aren't really great in the kingdom. Greatness in the kingdom isn't eloquence of speech. Not, not being, me being able to preach really good to you. That's not, there's not one place in the Bible does it say that. Now, that's a great man because he can preach really good. Not, where, not anywhere. But this is, is everywhere. David said it this way. He said, I'd rather be a doorkeeper in the house of God 
than serving the devil like I used to. I'd rather be, that means, uh, uh, y'all know what that means, right? Uh, y'all do, that means, what's up, man? That means right here, right here, right here. Good to see you this morning. I'm, there's nobody out here, by the way. So good to have you. God bless you. Thank you for coming today. It's going to be a wonderful Sunday. And just stand there and just do that as long as you need to. Dork, I can't be, I, I, I have to show up early to do that. Amen. Yes. Amen. Yes. Amen. Yes. Amen. I believe that all of our joy level could be multiplied if we would just choose one or two things on a weekly basis that are completely unselfish to do whether it's in the church or anywhere for that matter. Just choose a couple things. Say, I'm gonna do this, and I'm gonna be a blessing to somebody, even if they don't know it was me. That's difficult. Why? Because it, it's really easy to want to be a blessing, especially when they find out it's you. Okay, I'm, I am such a blessing. I'm telling you what, I'm gonna be a blessing, and you're gonna know. Right? Anybody ever tried to be a blessing to somebody and, um, and you thought they were going to be grateful and they weren't? And you're like, hey, I'm such a blessing. How come you are not acknowledging my blessingness? I, I did that one time. I paid, paid for somebody's lunch and I thought, I thought all of heaven was going to open wide. It wasn't for somebody in the church. Somebody I didn't know. I was like, I'm just going to be a blessing. I feel like I should, you know. So I'm a blessing to them. I pay for their food, and I thought they were going to be like, what is your name, sir? Man, thank you for paying for my lunch. What a blessing. I'm telling you, are you a pastor? I'm going to come to your church. Can I come to your church? I want to serve in your house. I tell you, I just want to be, I, I'm going to, can I get saved, filled with the Holy Ghost, slain the Spirit right here, right now, please? <laughs> you know how we have these kind of mindset like, you know, if I'm really good, I'm really generous and they better really acknowledge it and I better really get me somewhere. But if you really have a heart and an attitude to be a blessing, it's not about that at all now, is it? Right? Uh, my papa said it this way in his church. He said, uh, um, oh my goodness. He said, we, uh, we get those, oh man, Lord help me with this. We get those, it, the, the, the effect is this, we get those we do not serve because we serve those we do not get. Basically, I'm a blessing to some people in the community that they never end up coming to the church. But other people come because we were faithful with the ones that didn't come. So our attitude, even in reach, central Louisiana, isn't just so that those people will come. We're sowing seeds into the community, right? And however that comes back is however God's gonna let it come back, but I'm gonna keep sowing. Because I believe that if you sow seeds of generosity, there is a harvest and abundance of blessing that God will make sure hits your house if you serve the way he's called you to serve in his house and according to his kingdom. Amen. So that guy, I thought, he was gonna, uh, uh, I thought he was gonna really be happy. He said, thanks, bro. I'm like, thanks, bro. Thanks, bro? I mean, thanks, bro. That's it. Like that forty dollars for a thanks, bro. You just pick that food and shove it in your ear. I thought you was gonna be happy about this. But if your attitude and your heart is right, and it's it's a it's a generous heart, then it's not really about the thanks, bro. I made that into one word, didn't I? It's thanks, bro. Thanks, bro. <laughs> No spaces. Um, it's not about that or about a getting, getting get saved, filled in the Holy Ghost, slain the Spirit all right there. And that may happen on, it, that may happen sometimes, but if it doesn't happen that time, it's not up to me to make the harvest happen. It's up to me to sow the seed of generosity everywhere that I go and let God make the harvest happen in my life. Praise God. Woo, glory to God. I don't know about you, but it just makes me want to just give. And Jesus said it this way in Matthew. He said, uh, he said, the person who holds on to his life is gonna lose it. 
And the person that, that loses his life for my sake is going to find it. That means the person who's trying to get all they can out of life, you know, and just trying to make it all happen, and it's all me, and I'm so good, and I, you know, it's, uh, that person is just going to be stuck with that. But the person who gives of themselves for the cause of Christ and lives generously is the person whew, that is truly living and allowing the life of Christ to flow through them. Hallelujah. 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 We read the story, and it's book of Acts chapter 3, I believe. And it's, it's about James and John again. And they're going to the temple to pray about the ninth hour, it says. And they're going there, and there's a man there who's been lame from his mother's womb. Couldn't, couldn't walk the entirety of his life. They're walking by him, and he's begging. And they say to him, look on us. Look on us. And so they, he looks to them, and I, I'm sure, what do you think he expected? He's a beggar. He's on the corner, right there at the, I believe it's the gate called Beautiful, sitting right there. And what do you think he's expecting? Well, what else does everybody else give him? Money, right? So what do they say? They say this. They say, silver and gold, have we none, or have I none? But such as I have, give I to you. Silver and gold, well, I mean, that doesn't mean they're, they're broke. Obviously, they're not completely broke in every aspect of the word because, I mean, they're living, they're eating, they're being a blessing. They're not, they're not begging on the side of the road, but, I mean, it'd be like walking by and you don't have nothing in your pocket, you know? Be like, don't have that, but I've got something else. And what I do have, I'm going to give to you. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. Amen. That joker got up. He, went, he got up. And he says he's leaping, shouting. He's praising God. I mean, and everybody who saw him, who knew that he couldn't walk for the entirety of his life, saw that and like, oh man, that guy, that guy that couldn't walk, it's not just walking. I mean, this is like a miracle. Not just because he stood up. Anybody ever had your leg in a cast or something like that? You have it in a cast? Your muscles need to be right, strengthened. You got to exercise. Get that back right again. This guy, he's jumping up. He's leaping. He's praising God. His legs have, have never worked. So not only can he walk, but it's like he's got muscles. Amazing. Now, what I love about this, and this is really what I want you to see, is they said this, what I do have, I give to you. And so many times we have so many excuses as to why we don't give. I, I don't have a whole lot of money. I'm not as talented as so-and-so. I don't have the position. I don't have the experience. I don't have the opportunity, right? I, what do you have? I promise you, you have something. And if all you have is Jesus, apparently that's enough to revolutionize somebody's world. What do you have? Well, I can't sing like April. Well, welcome to the club. I can't, I can't organize like so-and-so. I'm not, but, but just because you're not like them doesn't mean you aren't good somewhere. Doesn't mean you can't give something of yourself somewhere. There's something that you have to give that you need to find a way to give it. And too many times we just have a little pity party like, well, see, now see, they're so, I mean, look at them. They're amazing. Me, I'm just me. That's all I've ever been. So me, I'm actually a really bad me too. I'm not even good at me. 
Everything about me I don't like about me. You need, that's a, you need to change your mindset. You need to see what God says about you. See what his word says about you. The Bible says that there are gifts and talents and that he, he has called you to something. What is it? What is it? You need to take the time to spend time with God, get in his word, listen to his Holy Spirit, find out what that is. Otherwise, you're going to be spinning your wheels thinking that you going on that one vacation is what's going to bring you joy and you're going to find out that you just went on vacation and came back and life is still the same. So I had, a, I had a couple drinks. Well, you have a couple drinks, and when you come to, you're going to find out that your name is still the same as your social security number. <laughs> yeah, but I can escape it all. No, you ain't going to escape it all. You might multiply it all. But if you can learn to let the life that you have in Jesus, that he has given to you when you believed on him, let that life be lived in you and let that life flow through you, then you can really live the joy of living the life in Christ is living in giving it. You cannot give what you do not have, but what you do have, you must give. Amen. You cannot give what you do not have, but what you do have, you must. Say, so what am I going to do? I'm just giving myself away and it's like, then I have nothing? Then what? No, no. Proverbs 11. There's one that scattereth, yet, yet increases. There's one that withholds more than they should and it leads to poverty. Yes. The generous soul will be made rich. Amen. That means have an abundance. Yes. And those who waters others will be watered themselves. Amen. That means reality is this. You really can't give too much. I've helped so many people, but it just doesn't seem like, well, all I can tell you is this. God's on time. And I believe he will be for you. The thing you might want to consider, though, is that if you haven't sown any seeds of generosity, don't be expecting a generous harvest to come back. Now, somebody said it this way, you know, don't, don't send a Piro out and expect a, a ship to come back. Like a, I did one thing for somebody one time five years ago. Send a Piro out. And you're expecting what? Someone to give you a car? Hey, that'd be nice. No, no, I'm not living to see who can give me something. I'm not living for that. I'm living to see who I can give something. When you change that mindset... It's amazing who starts giving you something. I'm not looking for opportunity. I'm looking to give somebody an opportunity. All of a sudden, as I'm looking to give somebody an opportunity, somebody give me an opportunity. I'm not looking for a place to preach. No, I've got too many places to preach. It's amazing how this works. I promise you this. If you'll work this thing, with the right attitude, you will love life. I said, you will love life. Now, I'm not looking for a handout. I'm looking to hand something out. Can I hand something out? Hallelujah. Praise God. Praise God. Praise the Lord. He's treated you so generously. How can you not live generously? That's what he said. That's what Jesus, that's what he said. Acts, what did it say? There's more joy in giving than in receiving. 
I said there's more joy in giving than there is in receiving. Hallelujah. 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 I, I like the way, and I'll finish with this. In Galatians, it says it this way. Uh, I believe it's Galatians uh, chapter 5, chapter 6, right in there. It says a man's harvest in life depends entirely upon what he sows. A man's harvest in life depends entirely upon what he sows. So to some degree, the harvest that you have in life right now is directly related to what you have sown prior to now. And that would include every arena of life. So for me, the way I live, the way we give of ourself, our time, our effort, our energy, our finances is directly related to what am I expecting in the future? What am I believing for in the future is directly related to my giving. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. And guess what? I'm not the judge. I can't make things happen, but I can do my part. I can sow seeds of generosity in every area of my life, and I can believe for a harvest. Amen. And I believe God is good at bringing back the harvest. Amen. Anybody know what I'm talking about? Yeah. I said, God is good at bringing back the harvest. Amen. Amen. Living generously, it really just opens the door for you to live generously, abundantly. Generosity, it begins with God, but it shouldn't stop with him, right? Generosity begins with God, but it's supposed to flow through us. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Amen. Amen. So I encourage you, uh, this week, evaluate your life. Stop, pray, spend some time, say, Holy Spirit, help me to be a giver. Help me to live giving. Show me some ways that I can do that. I'm, there's obvious ways as far as bringing your tithe, giving an offering to the Lord, but there's other ways you can give as well. My time, my energies, how can I serve? How can I be a part, how can I be a part of being a blessing? How can I be a part of that? I believe as we do that together, we will have great joy together. Anybody else want to live, live life filled with joy? Amen. Enjoy in life? See, I lost half of you. I started, I started out with most of you. I lost half of you. Why? Because it's a little different, isn't it? A little different than just, you know what, you know, I'm just going to let God just bless me. It's more, it's, 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 it's maturing in Christ and saying, you know what, I'm living life to give. The wonderful thing about giving is that it flows through you. I said it flows through you. And when things flow through you, you get blessed in the process. So yeah, a new car comes, new house comes, all that stuff. It's all part of the blessing. Why? It's just flowing through me. I, like the one preacher said, and you've heard it said many times, if God can get something through you, he can get it to you. It's absolutely the truth. If God knows he can trust you and say, you know, I'm going to let that flow through, that, then he'll get it to you. 